I think that uh, hymn, perhaps the word's not familiar, certainly the tune, uh, does encapsulate uh, what we want to share this morning from Mark's Gospel, Chapter 1. And I have, um, uh, like Adam, prepared some notes for you. Um, don't have all the verses to go up on the screen like he does, uh, but um, I've made it easy. I haven't left anything for you to fill out this morning. It's all there. Um, so hopefully you can follow through, take it home, and um, there'll be some scriptures there that I'm sure that you'll want to look up again. Mm-hmm. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We want to consider that gospel this morning as far as it relates to us and in us and through us. On October the 14th last year, the Adelaide Football Club was excited to announce the appointment of Matthew Nix as its new senior coach for the next three years. And the announcement said he joins the Crows from grand finalists Greater Western Sydney, where he was senior assistant coach in 2019. It was to be the beginning of a new era for the Crows. It was. They became wooden spooners for the first time (laughs) in history. Um, but um, let's not give up on them. Um, the, they have turned the corner and things are looking up for 2021. But this morning we want to look at another event. It wasn't announced on any television service or broadcast uh, by satellite. It was unheralded. Yet it was to change the world forever. And has affected people for the next 20 centuries. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The world was never the same. It was the new beginning for the whole world. The Roman Empire was to go on for another 400 years to be followed by the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and so on. But a new dawn had come. We read of John the Baptist and his father, Zacharias, in speaking at the birth of his son, referred to the day spring from on high, which hath visited us to give light to them that walk in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And what he saw was the coming of the gospel. A new dawn that streaked across the sky and it shone brighter and brighter. And through Christ it brought healing and hope and light and deliverance from a world that you would have to agree at the time and ever since is characterised by tragedy, the blight and the blast and the devastation of sin. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, Go ye into all the world with this gospel and preach it to every creature. And verse 20 of Mark 16 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. the Lord working with them. The challenge for his followers then and today, for us even here, is are we with him in his work today? Are you with him in this work of the gospel? Perhaps you once were more involved with him than you are today. You might say, I'm not sure, I've lost my enthusiasm, I once had it, but people aren't interested in this gospel today, not so much, 
and uh, I've become a little discouraged about it, perhaps somewhat distracted. Picking up the theme of the crows again, last Sunday I was interested in um, a lift out in the Sunday Mail. It was a 24-page lift out. I thought, whatever this is, all sorts of lift outs you sort of shake out of the paper. Um, but this one was a hero's list. It was to thank loyal Crow supporters who didn't cancel their membership in 2020. And it said something like, thank you for standing with us in 2020. And then there was an alphabetical list of 40,000, whatever number the membership of the Crows is, every name of everyone who'd stayed committed to the Adelaide Football Club in this incredibly challenging year. Interesting way to do it. We want to consider this morning something more exciting than a premiership for a football team. It's how can we get a renewed enthusiasm for the gospel this morning? How can we become gripped by it so that together, as we go out into the world around about us, we can share it more faithfully? So this first chapter of Mark is really just a springboard for us this morning to consider this theme. And as you can see on your sheet, I've, I've taken three very small two-word phrases just to help us through. And we'll come up with an application for each one of them. The, the phrases are simply, I send, behold, I send, verse 2. Second one is, John did, verse 4. And then finally, Jesus came, verse 9 and verse 14, Jesus came. So the first phrase is, I send. In Mark 1 verse 2, as he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, as it is written, the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before your face to prepare your way. So God sent his messenger John into the desert to prepare the way for his son, Jesus, himself sent by God, into the world. And here we have the sending heart of God. And the gospel emanates and originates from the very heart of God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You say, what sort of heart has God got? Well, he has a righteous heart. He has a righteous heart. It says in Psalm 145, verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and he is holy in all his works. Isaiah 40 tells us that the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. We've just been singing about that uh, in our last hymn. The glory of the Lord was revealed when Jesus came in grace and truth. And it will be revealed when he returns again. All flesh shall see it together. What is the ultimate purpose in the heart of God? The righteousness of God is all about bringing the glory of God. Romans 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It includes his wrath against sin and ungodliness, but it also includes his unfathomable grace to all who believe by faith. You see, God's righteousness is his unswerving commitment to uphold the worth of his glory. Everything Jesus suffered on the cross, he suffered for God's glory. He suffered death so that Sinners who had desecrated and despised and fallen short of his glory might one day be restored and share in that glory for eternity. And 
This is something we cannot fathom, why he would choose you and me. Who had fallen short of his glory and rebelled and rejected him. And he would embrace us as sons and daughters to share in his glory for eternity. And try and fathom that. So the heart of God is a righteous heart, but it's also a broken heart. We looked in our last little group uh, on Tuesday night at Isaiah 50, and it speaks of God's view of the world. He says, Behold at my rebuke, I dry up the sea, I make the rivers as wilderness, I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. See, the sin of the world is like it's like the Darling River, which dries up and fish die and stink. And God says his heart looks at the world and sees that and it breaks his heart. Sin is breaking the heart of God. And into such a world God has sent his son. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus comes with the heart of God. Sinners. It's an interesting verse in 1 John 3 8, which says, For this reason was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And if you're interested in the Greek words, <clears throat> the little word luo is the word that's translated destroy. But it's interesting that it's also used in our passage in Mark 1, in verse 7, where it speaks of John who says he's not worthy to stoop down and untie the shoelaces of Jesus. You see, luo does mean to destroy but it means to loose to deliver to free to break to untie here we have god his heart of brokenness stooping down through christ to untie the chains of sin that bind us it takes a lot of unraveling our lives are in a mess and it's easy to look at people on the outside and think they're all looking good and everything's fine. But God looks at people and he loves them and he wants to desperately untie and help them unravel that hidden mess in their heart. He has a broken heart. But he has a loving heart. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy and steadfast love. God so loved the world. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And Jesus, when he looked at the crowds and he saw them as, as sheep without a shepherd, it says in Matthew 9 that he had compassion on them. He was moved with compassion. <clears throat> he saw the rich young ruler turn his back and reject him and he loved him <coughs> behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God <coughs> So the application, as I <clears throat> consider this, is do I, have, <clears throat> do I have this burden that God has? Yeah. I remember the story my father used to tell of um, the Water Street Mission in New York. <clears throat> it was on the front line there of the down and outs in New York a century ago. <clears throat> it 
was started by a fellow called Walter Macaulay. And he won to the Lord a young man, Sam Hadley, who himself was <coughs> a drunk, but he was gloriously converted. One day Sam took a friend with him <coughs> to show him the, the depths of night, the, the desperate needs of people <coughs> in the down and out areas of New York. They went to the liquor places, the haunts of, of prostitution and the dens of iniquity. And they saw <coughs> the desperate need of men and women in that city. And after they'd finished and parted, a friend was heading off and then he heard some groaning. And he turned around and saw his friend Sam Hadley leaning up against a pole, just crying out to God, Oh God, oh God, the sin of this city is breaking my heart. Oh God. He was a man who, whose heart was touched and broken by the needs of men and women. Paul says, the love of Christ impels me. That word means it lays hold of me, it constrains me, it wraps itself around me. So when we see people, we no longer see them as they are, but as they could be. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We actually see them as they could be in Christ. Some workers in the Salvation Army in England in the days of William Booth were finding it hard to reach out into the town that they'd been sent to. They'd prayed, they'd worked, they'd gone out in the streets, they'd evangelised. <coughs> and They reported back to William Booth how difficult it was to reach people. And he sent back a two-word answer, try tears. Try tears. Broken. Burdened. Yeah. Our second phrase is John did. John did. He appeared. He came to baptize in the wilderness to preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He appeared and he did what God told him to do. <clears throat> How strange it was to have seen this crazy man in the wilderness, clothed with camel's hair. Out of obscurity, John appeared. Unlikely, untimely, a voice crying in the wilderness. Not a voice of a high priest or of a Pharisee, but a man who ate locusts and wild honey. Boldly, Standing for truth it was to put him in jail not long after. It was to lose his life. But he was sincere. He was simple. It was a cry. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But it was clear. It's like a signpost. My wife and I were visiting... Carrick Hill Mansion a few weeks ago and you drive around the streets behind Carrick Hill <coughs> in Springfield and all the street signs are done in this beautiful signage, lettering. <coughs> it's quite remarkable. I've never seen anything like it anywhere in Adelaide. The signpost points to a destination. It matters little, little whether the signpost is pretty or ugly or whether it's old or new. It does help if the letters are clear and bold. The essential feature of a signpost is that it points in the right direction and it's clear about what it's pointing to. 
should be witnesses unto me, Jesus said. And some of us get strung up about how we do things and how we come across and whether we have the right approach. We sometimes complicate things when focus is not on us at all. It's just upon Jesus Christ. Don't be enamored with the state of your Christianity or the state of your witness. Be enamored with Christ and just confess what he means to you, like John did. Be clear. But not only was he clear, he was humble. After me comes one who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He said at another time, he must increase, I must decrease. He was willing to be a man, <clears throat> but nothing really. He was willing to be nothing, that Jesus might be everything. In fact, Jesus said of him in John 5.35, John was a burning and shining light. <clears throat> Just a wick. Just a wick of a candle was John. And the wick must burn if the light is to shine. Someone said, what have we time and strength for but to lay out both for God. What is a candle made for but to burn? Burnt and wasted, we must willing to be. And should it not be enlightening men and women to heaven and thus working for God than living for ourselves? That was Richard Baxter, of a Puritan of the 17th century. So what is the lesson? From this phrase, John came, <clears throat> for me, it's just the question, is my life a flame for God? Am I ignitable? Jim Elliot, that missionary to the Yorker Indians, as a young man, asked that question to himself, am I ignitable, Lord? Lord, deliver me from the dread asbestos of worldly things. Am I ignitable? Is my life a flame for the sake of the gospel? Finally, the third phrase, <clears throat> Jesus came. Lovely phrase, Jesus came. The thief comes only to, th to kill and destroy, and to steal. John 10 says, I am come that man might have life and have it more abundantly. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is salvation in none other name. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, it says in Acts 4.12. And this gospel is a life-changing gospel because of the person of that gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It was life-changing for Peter and Andrew and James and John But it had been some 12 months that Jesus had first met them in John 1 and they'd followed him. Jesus said, come and see, and they followed him and they listened to him, <clears throat> went back to their fishing. There's a period of 6 to 12 months in the Gospels which is the silent years of Jesus' ministry, silent months of Jesus' ministry. And here in Mark 1, he comes back some several months later he calls them. And they left their nets and followed him. Yes, a life-changing call, this call to follow Jesus. A new beginning. <clears throat> That's why Mark wrote his gospel. He wrote it so that people can meet this person and see who he is. And what he says, what he does, what he came for. In Mark 10, 45, it says he came to give his life a ransom for many. That's why John wrote his gospel. It says 
in John 20, 31, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. <clears throat> How do we get this gospel message, this life-changing message out? I've listed three ways. <clears throat> we'll just look at them briefly. To speak it out, to hold it out, to live it out. Speak it out. Psalm 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Yeah. You shall bear witness of me because you've been with me from the beginning, Jesus said to his disciples. <clears throat> Just a word of witness, a testimony. <clears throat> Mr. Keith Larkham was a shopkeeper in Sydney. He owned a, a hardware store and when I was 16, 17, I worked for him um, over the Christmas break. But he was a man who memorised the scriptures and uh, had a heart for people. But he, he believed that God would speak to him every morning as he read his Bible. And he used to write on a scrap of paper this little word that God had given him, put it in his pocket. And one of the first things we'd do, we'd get into the shop, we'd open up the shop, turn the lights on, get the money in the till. <coughs> and under the coin tray in his till, he would take out that little word that God had given him and he'd put it there in the till. And his prayer each day was, Lord, you will bring into the shop someone who needs that word. I would see him do it. Um, he would have an opportunity every day because he believed that <clears throat> God would give him that word who, and a person who needed that word. And he'd pull this little thing out and he'd say, well, actually, that's interesting you say that. Um, I was reading my Bible this morning and um, I actually wrote down what God said and, and it might be helpful for you. And he would just share like that. Someone has said the minister of the gospel must not be afraid of the wisdom of the world. God first gathered the unlearned, the 12 disciples, and he chose the foolish, you and me, to shame the wise. He did not teach fishermen by orators. He subdued orators by fishermen. If you think of the story of Peter and John in Acts. Acts 4.20, they were impelled to speak. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. <clears throat> yeah, just speak it out. Speak out that word. Hold it out. This is more the thought of holding forth the word of God, the word of truth. We have organizations like Gideon's and the Pocket Testament League who, who get the word out. They put it in hotels and they get it out. <clears throat> but, you know, we have that opportunity too. It's just the opportunity of, of perhaps inviting a friend or a neighbor or a relative to join with you in... Maybe taking, you know, a little gospel of Mark or John and just reading it together. Maybe handing it to them to take away and read. It might be the TV series or the um, movie series The Chosen, <clears throat> which is a wonderful series on the life of Jesus that you could watch with somebody. Whatever way it is to hold out this word of life. Jesus said, search the scriptures. They are they which testify of me. Hold it out. Live it out. Live it out. That's just being salt and light in the world each day as Christians. How do you do that? Well, it's the release of the life of Jesus quite unconsciously in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says in verse 
6. God said, let light shine out of darkness. And this light has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay, in vessels of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So how does the light shine? He goes on to say we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, we're not knocked out. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We're fragile people, we're humans like everyone else. We go through the rugged events of life. And as jars of clay, just a little crack. And the light shines out of that crack. Someone said we're cracked pots. Hopefully we're not crack pots. Perhaps we need to be crack pots. But the light shines out. And people see and they wonder. And they ask a reason for that light that shines out. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the gospel, the light of the gospel shines through the cracks of our earthly vessel. And it's the life of Jesus being manifest in us and through us. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. There was one further way that I thought of this morning after I've repaired these sheets. Yes, it, it, it is to be held out and, and lived out and spoken out. But the other way, it's forced out. And in Matthew 9, 36 to 38, Jesus said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. As he looked out amongst the crowds of people who were there with him, his heart was moved with compassion. And he said to his disciples, The, the harvest is plenteous. As he looks at our city, our world, he says the same thing, A harvest truly is plenteous. It's not the problem of the harvest. The labourers are few. And then he goes on to say, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth. That's that word, thrust out. Send out labourers into his harvest. Will you, will I join him in this great venture. Being a partner, being a hero, if you like, not a hero of the crows, a hero of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of this gospel could start in us and through us if we're willing to be nothing, that he might be everything. And I finish with Philippians 1.27. We need to do it together. As John was mentioning earlier about this weekend, it's a way to help us get a heart for each other. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Standing together, striving together in one spirit, one mind, side by side for the faith of the gospel. That is the challenge that I feel he would have us take away this morning. That together our lives will be worthy of this gospel. Amen.